All right, so I've just started the second year of my PhD. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about my PhD progress and where I'm headed in the future with that sort of research. So my PhD is tentatively titled at the moment Human Brain Transcriptomics Towards Understanding Neurodegeneration. So the human brain is one of the most complex tissue types known to humankind. Um, unfortunately, we don't really understand the molecular basis of this complexity. What we do know is that the human brain is prone to neurodegenerative diseases. So these are diseases that result in compromised brain function as we age. Unfortunately, we also don't know a lot about these guys. So, um, and our diagnostic tools and our treatment targets um, are virtually non-existent. And these guys are going to become a huge issue in the developed world by the middle of the 21st century. But before we can understand the disease state, first we have to be able to understand the healthy state. So you can break down my research into two basic questions. And these are the first one, what are the driving forces behind the complexity of the human brain? And number two, how do these elements contribute to neurodegenerative diseases? So we believe it's the transcriptome that contributes to the complexity of the human brain. So the transcriptome is all the RNA molecules present in a cell. So it includes rRNA, tRNA, um, and various non-coding RNAs. So all non-coding RNAs and microRNAs. Um, it's dynamic and will change depending on developmental, developmental stage, um, disease state, and even the environment. It's tissue specific, so the transcriptome in my liver will be very different from the transcriptome profile in my brain because they both have very different functions and very different cellular makeups. And since the human brain is a very heterogeneous organ, the transcriptome will vary from region to region in the human brain. So this network of alternative spliced RNAs and non-coding RNAs forms a multifaceted regulatory network. Um, and this guy can regulate DNA, RNA and proteins. So what we do is we take samples from the human brain and we profile it using RNA-seq. So more specifically, we're interested in these guys, the long non-coding RNAs. So these guys don't code for proteins, they're longer than 200 nucleotides, so this means that it excludes all microRNAs. Um, there's lots of evidence emerging suggesting they're functional, and they can regulate DNA, RNA and proteins. Now the most important point here is that many are species and tissue specific. So if we look at this figure, from, it's from the ENCODE GenCode project. So over here we have about 15,000 putative human long non-coding RNAs. And you can see that they're um, conserved amongst the primates generally. And then as soon as we drop out of this, well, green means they're conserved, red means they're not conserved. So in humans, as you would expect, most of them are present. And in chimps, they slowly fade out. And then as soon as we cross from the primate line, they disappear quite rapidly. So how does this relate to neurodegeneration? Currently, we don't really know. Um, so traditionally, a lot of study towards neurodegeneration has been based at the genome and the proteome level. We're hoping that the transcriptomics will offer new insights into these diseases and hopefully answer some of our unanswered questions. So this here is a review that I wrote last year, um, and this is about the role of alternatively spliced mRNA in the molecular pathology of many different neurodegenerative diseases. And we also performed an RNA-seq analysis of Alzheimer's disease brain and show that there's lots of splicing going on, basically. Um, so my PhD focuses on this guy, multiple systems atrophy, and all you need to know about that is it's similar to Parkinson's disease. So I'll talk a little bit about where I'm up to now in my PhD. So this here is a paper that we got accepted two months ago now, and I'm going to Geneva in December to present. Um, so what we did with this guy is we took grey matter and white matter from the healthy human brain. So what grey matter is, is it's the neurons. So they can be thought of as the computing centres of the brain. And these guys are connected by cables known as axons. And like electrical cables, these axons can be insulated to improve the signal transmission along them. Um, so whereas our grey matter is generally fixed throughout our lifetime, we're stuck with what we're born with, generally. The white matter um, is more plastic and changes up, keeps um, becoming joining up new connections into our mid-twenties and even into our late thirties. So in a teenager, it'll be quite underdeveloped and that's why we think teenagers are bad at making decisions in general. <laughs> so there's also evidence emerging which suggests that it's involved in intelligence and skill acquisition. So as you learn a new skill, certain pathways become stronger, which allows neurons to communicate more easily. Um, so over here, I have the transcriptome profiles from both grey matter and white matter. So again, grey matter is the neurons, white matter is the cables. So each dot represents a different gene. Um, over this side, this is grey matter, this is white matter. The red ones are those which are statistically significantly upregulated. 
So you can see that in grey matter there's a lot more transcription than there is in white matter and this would be an expected result. Now this is the thing that we're getting quite excited about. So we've identified this long antigenic non-coding RNA that we want to investigate further. So this guy is really interesting because there's, it's spliced to produce two ice forms. There's this guy with three axons and this guy with two axons. You can see down here we have a variety of different species. So we have chimp, rhesus monkey, mouse lemur, bush baby. Mouse lemur and bush baby are sort of like primates and they have huge eyes for people wondering. Then we have mouse, dog, elephant, opossum and chicken. So these green regions are regions of conservation. So you can see that this second ice form with two axons is conserved in primates. But it falls away in these other species. So this guy here is a primate specific long non-coding RNA. We then have this three axon one and this third axon is not conserved amongst any species. So this guy here is human specific. Now what makes it even more interesting is in the humans this guy is the dominant transcript. So it's expressed about seven times the level of this guy. So now we have a species specific long non-coding RNA. We've also started to analyze to see what the expression of this long non-coding RNA is like in other tissue types. So it seems that this guy is also upregulated quite a bit in human brain tissue. So now we have a species specific, tissue specific long non-coding RNA, which we suspect might be involved in fundamental brain function. So towards completing my PhD, which I'll hopefully do one day. Um, so first we want to further investigate this long non-coding RNA, LIG00263 in the brain. And to do that we want to perform some RNA interference of this non-coding RNA in neuronal and oligodendrocytic cell lines. So RNA interference has traditionally been used to knock down the mRNA of protein coding genes, but it can also be used to, lock, to knock down long non-coding RNAs. We'll then perform standard RNA seq of these cell lines and see if the expression levels of any of the genes have changed. Um, after that, and hopefully we'll have an idea of what's going on in the healthy human brain, I'm going to perform strand specific RNA seq on healthy and multiple systems atrophy brains. So strand specific RNA seq um, maintains the origin strand of the transcript. So all you really need to know is that it provides a higher resolution of um, RNA seq, basically. And I wrote about this earlier in the year. So future directions, which will hopefully come from my research, is um, I'm hoping that my research obviously provides insights into the complexity of the human brain. Um, we'll hopefully provide new loci for investigation in multiple systems atrophy. And overall, I hope that my studies of the healthy brain will form a resource for other researchers looking at other neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, hunting or Parkinson's disease. Um, ultimately, it will lead to the development of biomarkers and treatments for neurodegenerative diseases. This one here is quite a long way off at this stage. Hopefully it will be in my career, but we'll see. It's in my life. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so this is, I've got one slide on research and development. So first off, as I mentioned, these goals are long term. Hopefully we'll get there. Um, the other point that I want to make is that fundamental research is necessary. And I mean, I guess I'm pretty much preaching to the converted for that one. Um, the funding for this research will be initially from governments and most of the research will be based at universities. But latter stages of the drug development, when there's money to be made, will probably be taken over by pharmaceutical companies. Cool, so I'd just like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Michael Janitz, um, the guys from Neuroscience Research Australia, Professor Glenda Halliday and Dr. Scott Kim, Dr. Warren Kaplan from the Garvin Institute and the other members of my lab. References, thanks.